Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast. So good to have you with us today. Uh, I am Jason Romano, and it's great to have you tuning in. We hope you enjoyed our debut episode last week as we told the story of Marlins pitcher Adam Conley and heard from team chaplain Chris Lane and took us inside the clubhouse of how God was present in the midst of a terrible tragedy in losing their teammate Jose Fernandez in a boating accident last year. It was really powerful stuff. And if you have not heard it, I highly recommend you subscribe, you download, you get back to that episode and listen, whatever it takes, because that story was a powerful one. And I definitely hope you guys will listen to it and hear what they had to say. I also want to thank everyone who has sent in kind words and, and well wishes as we embark on this new journey together with Sports Spectrum and their podcast. Um, the response has been great. You guys are awesome. We're so grateful to hear from you, and uh, we're excited to bring these stories to you, and, and we do. We value your feedback, so continue to stay in touch with us. Let us know what you think, what you like, what you don't like. If you have any guest suggestions, send them in. We want to hear from you, and also leave a review. So if you're on iTunes and you see that little area where you can rate the podcast and review it, please do that on iTunes because that helps us get seen by more people. And the more people that see us, the more people that listen to us, the more people that can hear the amazing stories and testimonies of these people that we have on our podcast. So please do leave a rating for us on iTunes. Okay, today's podcast, it's a good one. Our guests are Matt Chandler and Matt Hasselbeck. You might recognize both of their names. They're in different fields. Matt Chandler, of course, is the pastor of the Village Church in Flower Mound, Texas, outside of Dallas. He's also the president of the Acts 29 Network, a partnership of church plants across the world. Matt is a well-known speaker and teacher of God's Word, traveling to conferences all over the country, really all over the world. And he's written a few books as well, including The Explicit Gospel, released back in 2012. Matt has mentored and pastored many people, including many athletes like former Cowboys quarterback Tony Romo and current Cowboys tight end Jason Witten. So Matt knows the sports world pretty well. He's got a great story to share about how he came to the faith and how he came to know Jesus. So that's coming up. And Matt Hasselbeck is our other guest. Many of you know Matt, longtime NFL quarterback who came into the NFL as Brett Favre's backup in 1998 with the Green Bay Packers. He was traded in 2001 to the Seahawks, where he eventually took over the starting position and led his team to the Super Bowl in 2005. He played 10 seasons in Seattle and finished his career with two seasons in Tennessee and then three seasons backing up Andrew Luck with the Colts before retiring in 2016. And he's currently working now at my old stomping grounds, ESPN, as an analyst working on their NFL coverage. And so it's really, it's it's awesome to have them together. And back in March of, of 2017, I had, it was really a unique experience of interviewing Matt and Matt together, a pastor and a quarterback or a longtime quarterback. And the discussion I think you'll see, it takes us in a few different directions, but it was really inspiring and uplifting. And the testimonies and the stories that they had to share were, were really great. So I think you'll enjoy this one. Here's our conversation with Pastor Matt Chandler and former NFL quarterback Matt Hasselbeck. Welcome, guys. Yeah, welcome. Good you to see you. got the Matt and Matt show. You used to work on the Mike and Mike show. I did. I worked for two or three years on Mike and Mike in the morning, and trying all of a sudden... Trying to set something up here. Hey, you never know what you God know, wants yeah, to we'll do. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Those we'll are, have to see where we go, Those right? are early mornings, that other show. <laughs> it is. I get up at 3.45 in the morning. I don't know how you guys feel Stings, about that. Yeah, no, I'm, a, I'm an early riser, but not that early. Yeah. Early. That's, I think, watches of the night it's, stuff. It's like a, that's middle of the night It's stuff. brutal, 3.45 yeah. in the morning. I'll just say no, that. Podcast is nice, because you can you can do it anytime, Exactly. That's right. And I can do it from the confines of my own home. So yeah. that's a beautiful thing. Uh, it is Matt and Matt. So I, I just, there's so many different places I think our conversation can go. And I'll, I want to first start with our listeners who might not know who you are, Matt okay. Chandler, and where you have been, your, your role as a pastor. There's so many different levels, but I think I want to just start with your testimony, how you became a Christian, how you came to Christ. I think there's a great story there. So I was um, not not raised in a, a Christian home per se. Mom was um, religious in, in regards to I think the way I've described her historically is she thought the Pharisees were a little light on their application of the law, and then my dad, <laughs> my dad fun. was the I mean that must it was have been real fun. It was just, I mean I'm telling you it was the, one of the stranger homes that you can imagine. And then my father I mean just had some real demons. I mean was abusive and 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 so I grew up in this home where I really got the worst of both things. Mm-hmm. I got the worst of religion and I got the worst of the world. Mm-hmm. And, and so it put me in this place where um, I, I really, 
if my mom's Jesus was where it was, I didn't want anything to do with him. Because in a very real way, like my mom's legalism is like, we've got to stay. It doesn't matter that your dad does the things that he does. The Bible says that we have to stay. And, and so in my head, Jesus is the one making me stay in this home where at any moment somebody might get the crap kicked out of them or there could be some explosion or there might be some other kind of abuse. And, and so in my head early, if it's Jesus, no thank you. Mm. And so daddy was military and we lived out in the Bay Area, uh, Novato is where we were. There was Hamilton Air Force Base. I think now it's Hamilton Wetlands. It's now like an expensive. But at, growing up there, it was just a Hamilton Air Force Base. Military kid. Uh, yeah, yeah, daddy was a Navy man. And then they moved us to Texas. And when we got to Texas, I mean, you, you have to play football in Texas. You don't have a lot of options. So I joked that I was on the team. You know, I didn't play much, <laughs> but I was on the team. And, you know, we're, we're new, and I'm uh, first, second day of full pads. I'm, I'm taking off my pads, and a guy named Jeff Faircloth, who actually ended up being a, a really good athlete, played college ball, never played in the pros, but played college ball. But, he, you know, back then it wasn't like it is now where it, it seems like there's just schools that are factories um, there's been some sort of genetic evolution or something that's occurred here, but uh, or maybe we just know about more about nutrition and training. But <laughs> yeah. um, he he comes up to me and and I mean just says, "I need to tell you about Jesus. When do you want to do that?" And uh, although I was not interested in Jesus, the courage he had in that moment was so disorienting for me because the and I and I joked about this even in a place I was preaching last night that that the locker room is just not a place where righteous, healthy, good things are discussed, at least not in my experience, right? They're crass and vulgar, and there's a lot of braggadocious kind of lying that occurs. And and Jeff's not whispering this to me. I mean, we're in the middle of all these people. And he said, I need to tell you about Jesus. When do you want to do that? So I, I was struck by what I now know to be his freedom. Like he just wasn't worried about what other people thought about him. He wasn't worried. He, he was going to tell me about Jesus. And and he was going to do it. He was going to let me choose where that happened. Yeah. But we were having that conversation. Um, and so, yeah, I, Jeff began to invite me to church. I began to go to church. It took um, a couple of years. He was so gracious because I'm quick-witted. And church to me felt like a Saturday Night Live sketch. <laughs> like I just couldn't believe. You yeah. know, we would sing songs like, um, I got joy down in my heart, deep, deep down in my heart. Spell it. And then everybody would, with their body, spell the word joy. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm like worldly. I mean, I just came from the Run DMC Beastie Boy con- concert. And then I'm looking at it, I'm just like, this, this has got to be a joke. We're, we're being filmed. We're, yeah. But what was happening, and I didn't even realize it was happening. It's fun now to think about it, um, is the Lord was just drawing me. Because as much as I would mock it and as much as I would point out how dumb it was, Jeff would always come back around, well, do you want to come next week? And I would always say, yes, can you pick me up? Wow. And, and so... Were you friends with this guy like uh, on the team? Well, not not really. Uh, I mean, I knew who he was. He knew who I was. Um, he he was older than me, two years older than me. And um, so, yeah, not, we weren't great friends. But anyway, he in fact, he's got his own story. He lived with his grandparents. His you know mom and dad had had a real, like some real issues there. And then Christ had just boldly saved him. What and do you so, think was the reason why you had your heart open to hear? For, was it because he was a little older and maybe somebody you, know, you looked I, up I, to? I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm really not. I, I think the thing I, th- I think I, the thing I remember thinking the most um, is how gutsy that, that statement was and how disorienting it was for me, um, for somebody to just, because I was a little embarrassed that he asked me. You know, but he didn't seem to be embarrassed asking. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I, I yeah. think it was that, like, I wanted that because I'm one of the guys. You know, I'm lying about stuff I've been doing or not doing but said I was doing. I mean, I'd just been a part of this environment. And that courage was so refreshing that, like, I felt like he was free in a way I wasn't free. And and so it's funny that it was really his boldness that, that made me begin to consider some things. And, and then he was the one that helped me kind of understand what the gospel is versus what it's not. And look, I, I appreciate your mom, but but this is what Jesus is actually doing in that verse. And, right. and he just became a guy that would give me books. And, and I've been an avid, I need to know why and how things work. I mean, I was that way since I was a little kid. I took apart our lawnmower, got beat for not putting it back together right. But I mean, I just need to know how it works. You know, how does this work? And so Jeff was super gracious and going, why don't you read this? You know, here's, here's Max Lucado's Applause of Heaven. Here's, you know. I don't think any of the kind of big apologetic books were out at that point. You know, um, no wonder they use called a carpenter. I mean, he was just giving me all these books that I would just devour. And then I'd write questions and come back. And he, he would say he didn't know when he didn't know. Uh, like, I never felt, you know, bold by him. Or, you know, it's like, gosh, that's yeah. a great question. I have no idea. Wow. And, and so, yeah, that, that's, 
That's how. That's pretty awesome. Being terrible at football is how I became a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt Hasselbeck, you are not terrible at football, obviously. But I'd love to hear. Uh, so many of our listeners are sports fans and know your story as a quarterback in the NFL. I want to hear about your faith story, how you came to Christ, and, and what that journey has been like. Yeah, I mean, it's been a long journey. I don't have like uh, some conversion experience story necessarily. Um, uh, I heard later, you know, that my parents became Christians, you know, after I was born. My dad was at a conference, at a PAO conference somewhere in, like, Arizona or somewhere. And I kind of heard this story later, but, like, I never, I didn't really even believe it because the only version of my parents I ever knew was this, like, really devout, um, Christian, committed mom and dad. You know, we, my dad played nine years in the NFL, played for the Patriots, the Raiders, the Vikings, and the Giants, and we were always part of a the team chapel program, probably much like a military kid, always part of a team chapel program in season. And then uh, in the off season, you know, it was different back then um, than it is today. There was no OTAs and all that stuff. And the off season was an off season. Like you'd go home and, uh, you know, we were plugged into a local church in our hometown. And that's just kind of what I knew to be, um, you know, people had asked me questions about my faith I could regurgitate, you know, what I'd learned in Sunday school or what I knew my mom and dad would say. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily like I, I believed what I believed because it's sort of what I was taught. Never really like fully investigated it, I don't think. You know, that went right through high school and college. I think the struggle for me, I can, I can um, relate quite a bit to what you're saying, like in a high school locker room, in a college locker room. You know, just how, like, there's this balance of, like, being a tough guy, like, being, especially in football, like, being a tough guy and being really good at your job. And, and you want to be, like, you know, every pep talk is, you know, filled with, like, you know, expletives and just, like, you know, curse words and just, you know, like, let's go kill him, you know, like yeah. that kind of an attitude. And yeah. I never really in my life knew any really, like, strong, tough guy Christians. Like, I, I should have because my dad was that way, but, like, I don't know. He was my dad, so I think I just took it for granted. <laughs> right, yeah. And so I get drafted <laughs> to the NFL, and there was always this, like, battle of, like, good and evil for me. With, like, like, how do I be the person that I'm trying to be? I basically would just look at the upperclassmen. You know, in the upperclassmen, I was like, okay, I'm going to almost be like you. Like, I'm not going to, you know, drink or smoke or whatever, but like, I'm going to almost be like you. I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit more than, so anyway, I get to the NFL and it was just a completely different experience. I see uh, guys who are the best in the world at what they do and they are tougher than anyone I've ever been around. And they're more devout than anyone I've ever been around. You know, um, you know, a guy named Reggie White comes to mind. You know, mm-hmm. he was on my team my first uh, year with the Green Bay Packers. And I would, like, this guy is the best in the world at what he does. And he's the, one of the toughest guys in the world. And just to hear him uh, share in our Bible studies or even preach, like, you know, like, I, I pray for suffering. I it just, it was like, like, what are you talking about? You pray for suffering. Like, that's the <laughs> stupidest thing I've ever heard of. And then he explains it. And he's just like, wow, that's like the most intelligent thing I've ever heard. Um, you guys, like, Robert Brooks was one of our wide receivers. And then I think in my second year, uh, Danny Werfel came to be on our team. And Danny Werfel was like, I grew up around the same time as him. We were in college together, and he was Heisman Trophy winner and candidate. And and uh, I was like, wow, it'd just be so cool to like get his autograph kind of a guy. Like, There's no way he's like really the way that <laughs> You're he You're totally is. fanboying. Totally was. Yeah. And I was like that with a lot of people. I mean, I would show up in my first mini camp and and Brett Favre is the quarterback, and he's like, how you doing? I'm Brett. He's like, hey, I want you to you know, do your best to compete with us, you know, make us all better. And I'm like, dude, you're Brett Favre. <laughs> yeah, I'll do what I can here. <laughs> it's crazy. But yet I saw guys who, um, I think part of my fear, I had a couple fears, like really like taking that next step in my faith was I didn't want to be, I don't know, I like had this image of like Easter Jesus, like, mm-hmm. oh, this dude with like a white dress and like he loves pastel colors and uh, feathered like, hair. Yeah, like yeah. that's not, what is that? That's yeah. the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Yeah. And um, remember Danny, I met, a, you know, he was always quizzing me and always doing stuff. And I sort of made a joke one day. I'm like, dude, you're going to be like a preacher someday. And he like teared up. He was like, that would be incredible. Hmm. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. You know, like, I, I thought, just a throwaway like, trying to jab him. <laughs> I swear, yeah, exactly. I was like, dude, we're like, our our job here is to try to be like Brett, try to be like Brett. Yeah. And he was, uh, and I said, oh, you're just going to be a preacher someday. And he just teared up. Like, wow. that would be the joy of my life. And I was like, whoa, like, this is, 
I don't know. It was it was powerful to me. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, he had he's like, hey, do me a favor, read this book. Uh, it was more than a carpenter by Josh McDowell, and um, he's like, just tell me what you think. And I just I, what I realized is I didn't really know why. Yeah. You know, I was someone like in a quarterback room when a coach would give me a play, he'd be like, all right, here's the play, and I'd be like, okay, I'll memorize it, yeah. got it. But I never really cared to know like, well, why do we do it that way? And I think with my faith, it was the same thing. I, I've, I've for the first time, really started to ask questions. Like, all right, are we sure about this? And I became, like, very skeptical, which I think has actually been helpful. Sure. I know it helped me as a quarterback. I know it's helped me in my faith. Like, I, I mean, obviously it's faith for a reason, so you can't know, but there's so much evidence. To me now, there's so much evidence that I have so much, like, faith and courage and um, trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I have trust that my homework is leading me down the right path and then and just I guess my life experiences too and so I just I I think I credit you know obviously my parents and different people along the way and there were some definitely some some mountaintops and some valleys but uh really just seeing it authentically lived out in the locker room ironically of all places um was really really powerful and then coaches here and there and chaplains here and there and um we had a player programs guy named Gil Bird in Green Bay, and uh, he was just relentless on me. Hmm. Like, I just ran out of excuses on this guy. I was a <laughs> single guy in Green Bay. He's like, what are you doing Friday? I was like, well, you know, he's like, you're coming with me. I'm like, ah, shoot. <laughs> you know, but he pursued me, yeah. like, all the time. And it just, uh, he knew. He was there. He'd been there. So uh, wow. I'm grateful for all those people. That's a great, that's a great yes. testimony. Matt Chandler, so you listen to Matt Hasselbeck's story. You listen yeah. to his testimony. You have been, uh, you know, for those who don't know, obviously you've pastored many, we'll call we'll just say famous football players. Sure. You know, it's pretty known that you are, you know, and have pastored Tony Romo and discipled him. What comes to mind when you hear his testimony and, and, and the experiences that you've had as a pastor in, in dealing with people who are in the limelight, like football players? Yeah. Well, I love um, Matt's story. I, I think it, it has all the kind of um, elements of, of real life, right? And I think that's the thing that people forget around high-profile athletes is they, they have the same insecurities, the same fears, and even the yeah. ones that are insanely successful are still human beings. And there's some things that the Bible just tells us about human beings that are true regardless of how famous or the contracts or the... But I do think there's some unique hurdles. Like one of the things that Matt said that I think is just so important and I have found specifically around NFL guys is that there's a, there's a misunderstanding of what the gospel is, what Christianity is. And, and I think there's this, especially in pro athletes, I found there's, this, there's such a drive to nail it, to do it perfectly, to rep it until it it's... You know, you're not even thinking about it anymore. It, it just happens. Yeah. That they approach faith that way, but faith is messier than that. In fact, uh, Martin Luther uh, said, I thought of this quote when, when you were talking, Matt, is Martin Luther said that faith is a wrestle with doubt. So the guy that, that started the Re- Protestant Reformation is saying, no, no, what faith is, is this long wrestle with doubt. And, and that you keep, you know, coming across these things like, what do I do with that? And, and then you, you grow and you study and you're supported by community. And, you, mm-hmm. and, and I found that, that athletes in particular, because of not necessarily the high profile nature of, of what they do, yeah. but the reality that what they do demands this kind of work ethic and this kind of, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but my, my experience, because I'm not an athlete in this way, is that I, I think a lot of these guys... High school was just like, what? They were just naturally better than anyone else. And then college, some of them were. But then they, there were others that were like, man, we got to start working. And then by the time you get to the pros, people are working. And, and I mean, you might be a genetic freak, but, but you still are going to need to put in the work. And, and again, it's repping and repping and repping and repping until you're not thinking anymore. You're, you see it and it's half a second and you've made the decision and you've gone. Yeah. And when you bring that kind of approach to faith... It, it gets a little too clean and neat, and then you're going to feel like a failure. And because you, you'll get to where you can't, because growth happens so incrementally in faith, it, you won't be able again to see how much you've actually grown. Um, so I, I use, I've, I've used the illustration before that we, um, Lauren and I bought uh, a house and the yard was terrible. Uh, and so, man, we just got to work on it. You know, you, you're pulling things and you're, um, 
putting other things down mm-hmm. and you're, and then I started to realize that I could still, oh gosh, I hate that about, and I hate that about, but our friends would come over and go, gosh, your yard looks incredible. And, and it was this picture of how I'm unaware the, of the work that we've even done and we've seen change, but other people can see it. Um, and, and so it gets to where I, I think, like if I think of the three or four guys that, that I've been able to kind of grow in a friendship with and that yeah. their approach to faith and their understanding of grace um, can, they, they, they get kind of, they need to be recalibrated often uh, about what it means to just melt into Jesus as opposed to nail it and be perfect at it and succeed at it. And hmm. so, so that's been a, that's been a significant hurdle. Um, and, and I think the other significant hurdle is, is specifically as a pastor, like, like I'm, I, I need, it just seems to be really clear that I'm, I don't care. Right. Uh, and, and I have a lot of respect for what you do, but you throw a ball for a living or you catch a ball for a living. So I can't do that. <laughs> right. There's no question I can't do that. You've got some God-given gifts and abilities that are stunning. I mean, this goes back to what I heard Trip Lee talk about, right? That, that you're amazing and you're normal. Yeah. And it's just such a good word for athletes. That, that man, but just because you're amazing at this doesn't mean you're going to be amazing on a whole lot of other things. And, and so to, to take the approach of, man, praise God for what he's doing with you, but you're just a guy, uh, I, I think is needed and necessary in the life of a, a, a well-known pro athlete. Yeah. Because my experience is there's just a lot of guys around that guy who are celebrating his gift, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, it really is. Specifically, the quarterback position. Like, the quarterback position blows my mind. Like, because the combination of skills that you have to have to make that work. I mean, it, I mean, how many of it's true, but it's also true that like you could most of us could never play another position. So like before we get all you know excited about how get, good we are that we can play quarterback, right? Yeah, but you could actually play no other position. So <laughs> like, I and, really I, and I totally hear that, but you're just like uh, but all the we can do play is the most important. Uh, all we can do yeah. is help a team, you know, <laughs> yeah. ultimately succeed or not, right? So, yeah. it, and that could be said, like, what's, well, I, a, what's I, a left guard going to play if he's not playing left guard? Uh, he could play D-tackle. I guess that, that would be play the other center. One. See, there, here's, my, guard. here's my Some football knowledge. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't have brought that up. I, <laughs> no. I forgot where I was contextually for a moment. <laughs> I got something. I appreciate what, you, what you're saying about just like, hey, I don't really care about that. One of the biggest... Um, pitfalls that I see that players have and I had myself even was like you feel really uncomfortable plugging into a local church in the off season yeah. like in season you got your team chaplain you got your men's bible study you probably have a couple study on your team and you have chapel on the road and um, but then the off season I believe it's very very important to plug into a local church and there's something awkward about that yeah. like you like just being a new person at a church. Yes, Never mind if, like if you're sure. the quarterback of the team in your city, but like stepping into a church, you know, we just recently moved. We're we're um, we're, we're trying to find a home church, and you step in there for the first time, and you know what a visitor feels like. But yeah. I remember when I was in Seattle, you know, we were we were attending a church, and, and luckily I had a little bit of uh, insulation because my coach went, my position coach went there, and I knew a couple other people at the church. But uh, they could kind of point me in the right direction, tell me where to go, and introduce me to some of the right people. And, yeah. um, but like you're there, you're there to, to to grow and to learn and to worship and and not necessarily. L- luckily, I came into the NFL in Seattle. I wasn't a, like a well known person, so I was able to sort of go to church, check my kids in in the, the children's area, plug in, do some stuff. But I remember later, like when things were really happening for us in Seattle, when I was a lot more successful. It was a struggle, and I wanted to serve and be a part of the church, but I didn't. I don't know. I was doing. But you're being pulled in a hundred different directions. Yeah, so like I would, I would serve in like the kids' ministry, like ages like six or below, because like those kids didn't care. Like, oh, dude, you're just Annabelle's dad. They didn't care (laughs) that I was number eight on the Seahawks. You know, and and I remember uh, one of the best things I did. Our church opened a new location, and they needed people to set up chairs early in the morning. And so I was like, okay, great, it's perfect. There's like no people there. I set up chairs with like seriously some of the best people I've ever met in my life, and. um, built like real relationships, if if that makes any sense, instead of just like the what's up in church yeah. relationships, and then got involved in small groups and got involved in other things. And I just, I, I, it's real. It's my, my biggest encouragement to to young quarterbacks. Is it's like sort of a 
a non-negotiable. Yeah. It won't care how uncomfortable it is. Find a church where hmm. you can just be you yeah. and uh, and plug in. Matt Chandler, how possible is that, though? Like, so I, I think Tony, it is How possible. possible is Tony Romo to just be himself in a congregation at a church when you're Tony Romo? You well, know it, what I mean? It takes time, but sure. it's possible. Okay. You know, I, one of the things I would... One of the things I've been most proud about in my 14 years as pastor of the village is that Tony's there and mostly people leave him alone. That's good. And, yeah. and that wasn't by any coaching of our own. We've just made a really big deal about some of the things I've already said. That, that here's the thing. That the ground's level. Yeah. That, like, God doesn't have any superstars. I right. mean, his team is I mean, the, the team he has picked has always been kind of this guy's. Like, you look at Peter. Like, nobody's picking Peter to lead the team, right? I mean, that dude, Jesus called him Satan, right? Like, how, how terrible are you that Jesus called you the devil? Like you, the one victory you had, you're the son of God, right, it is then washed away in three verses later when then you rebuke the one you just said was God in the flesh. Yeah. So, like, God's got this ability to pick the least of these and then really do profound things with them. Um, and so, man, I, I just want to constantly teach our people that, man, the real magic of the Christian life happens in the ordinary. It, it happens loving your wife, raising your kids, being faithful at your job. Mm. And and I, I'm hopeful that that's what, by and large, he's left alone. But he's there Sunday morning at 9 in the off season, um, and then in the season where he can. And I know he's got a group of guys that... Um, well, that's what I was going to ask about the fellowship and the people, the accountability, Matt, that's Matt Hasselbeck. That's important, right? Like you, you say plugged into a local church and then you say, okay, nobody's going to bother you. But at the same time, you like want to build a community of people who are like-minded that you can spend time with and do life with and all that, right? You know, the irony for me is like when I plugged in, the people that I've learned the most from have been just so much older than me. Mm. You know, some of my that's best friends that I've gotten from church situations and uh, like the like groups or different service things or trips, they've been like been there, done that kind of guys. And it's like you know, I'm 41. It's almost never someone 41. Almost never. Yeah. It's someone 61. Mm-hmm. Or one of my best friends I ever made in Seattle. He was almost 90 years old, and he was just uh, one of the most influential guys. And there are tons of them, but like you would, it would be unlikely. And then it, when I, later in my career, I was in, I was in Nashville, Tennessee. I was turned 35, which is like, you know, you're basically Moses in the NFL. <laughs> and I remember we had, we had two young quarterbacks and, uh, and a first year guy and a second year guy. And they're like, well, how's this going to go down? How's a 35 year old going to get along with a, you know, two young guys. I was like, that, it, what is, what, that's nothing. Yeah. I mean, that's nothing. Um, so I just think there's incredible value in that. I know my wife would agree. My my wife would absolutely agree. And uh, and you also, like, for us, you get to kind of see, like, you know, read the end of the book. Like, see yeah. how it turns out. Like, you see how these families have, you know, like, okay, we're taking parenting advice from you. <laughs> like, yeah. can I see how that worked out? And, like, yeah, I see your yeah. amazing family. Like, okay, yes, yes, perfect. Love this. What else can I do? Right. Give me more advice. Yeah. Can we come to your house for Thanksgiving? Like, all those kinds of things. Um, there's value in that, and that that's definitely been our experience. That's great. Interesting. Matt Chandler, I want to tell the story. I want you to tell the story, because not everybody knows who you are, about 2009, Thanksgiving right. Day, yeah. and what God has done through that situation. You can tell the story, take us back, and, and then we'll, we'll end on that. Yeah. Well, I've... You know, my, I've grown up my entire life extremely healthy, no illness, no history of illness in my family. Um, woke up on Thanksgiving morning, 2009, just like any other Thanksgiving morning. Lauren had already started making some dishes to take to her parents' house. That's where we were. They lived just a few blocks from us, so we were going over there for Thanksgiving. Um, so we had a six-month-old at the time. Nora was six months old. She's seven now and full of life. But um, <laughs> I fed her her bottle while Lauren was, and then I put her in her Johnny Jump Up, and then I turned to go back to my chair and woke up in the hospital. Mm. So they found a golf ball sized tumor in my right frontal lobe. And um, we went to a neurosurgeon um, just a few days later. So that was a Thursday. We went to the neurosurgeon on Monday. Um, and, and we're fully expecting to hear something like, okay, we'll need to manage this with meds because they'd already put me on some anti seizure meds. And he, he did not say that. I mean, he was really anxious for me. Um, told me we're going to need to do surgery. In fact, he had made a space for me on Friday. 
So I mean, it's a it's a scary thing to come in um, thinking you're going to hear you get some meds to no no on Friday yeah. for ten hours four days later we're gonna we're gonna saw open your cranium we're gonna remove this thing wow. and we're gonna be as aggressive as we can and then you know some of the stuff that's scary is then they start walking through here's what could happen and right frontal lobe is what they call the silent hemisphere it's where it's where spatial reasoning takes place so it's basically where your brain looks at information and then files it so I'm thinking. Oh my gosh, that's all I do. <laughs> it's a that's the only gift I have. For, you know, what happens if that goes? So then now we get back to the identity question. Like, am I a preacher or am I a child of God? Like, like what mm. defines me, that I'm him or this job? Which is something I, every athlete I've ever met struggles with. Mm. And, and rightfully so. I mean, they started being defined by that as a kid. And, and it just kind of follows them as far as they play. And so it's a shocking thing when it's over. So now it's my turn. All right, am I a preacher? Uh, am I smart and quick? And or do I belong to the Lord? Hmm. And um, so we did that, and then came back malignant, incurable. Two to three years to live was the prognosis. Um, and the good news was that for more than half of that three years, I, they were going to try to poison me to death. Right. And so um, right. did low dose chemo, radiation for six weeks. Got a month off. Um, and then 18 months of high-dose chemo. And the scans just kept coming back clear. Um, and then, man, that was seven years ago. Still have to get scans twice a year. Still on one medication. It's an anti-seizure med, not because I've ever had another seizure, but because of the radiation damage and uh, hmm. um, the surgery itself. The likelihood of me having a seizure is really high. So I've got to take those meds. And, man, I, I just would testify. I, I mean, I think the Lord healed me. I mean, I would claim that he has. The doctors wait for it to come back. It's not It's not one of those cancers that, like, once you make it to five years, don't worry about it anymore. You know, you're just kind of always on the clock. But, you know, I joke with my neuro-oncologist that it's a, you know, I know she's using math. I know she's got a bell curve, and I know I'm landing somewhere on her bell curve. But, um, man, we just believe the Lord's healed me, and I've testified to that end. And, man, if he's got other plans for me, then I'm going to hold my life with open hands because there's not much else you can do. And um, But the Lord has profoundly used that in the life of our church. Um, and, and as, I mean, I just can't tell it, it is weekly that I'm talking with someone about this who either just got the news or who has a parent who has, or which, which allows me to minister with a great deal of empathy. Hmm. Uh, cause I do know what it's like to get that news. I know what it's like to feel like the floor just fell out. I know what it's like to wonder if you get to walk your daughters down the aisle, or if you ever get to see your boy become the man that you hope he does. Like I feel that I, I've felt yeah, I felt all of those things deeply. Um, and and so it, it's just opened a lot of doors. And and no one, no one, like one, of, one of the things that was, that was so encouraging to me about what the Lord had done in my heart was that nothing in my understanding of the Lord changed when I, because up until that moment, everything we touched went to gold. I mean, all, everything I'd ever done was wild and not, not mildly successful, but by the world standards, wildly successful. Right. I mean, I'm pastoring a church that went from 160 to 10,000, like nearly overnight. Right. And, um, and, and man, we made much of Jesus and all of that. And it was my wife because we, we fought this thing very publicly and I did weekly updates and blogs. And, um, I wasn't going to do that cause I was anxious about like, what would happen if I came out of surgery and I started saying really crazy things? Yeah. I mean, I was a very serious concern of mine, but my wife who's stronger than I am, just said, hey, you you have made much of the Lord and all of his blessings on you. I think it'd be a real mistake to not now use this opportunity to make much of him when nothing's going our mm. way. Yeah. And so those weekly blogs were actually birthed out of my wife's encouragement to, you need to, as bad as this sucks, help people understand that God's at work in the mess. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we started those blogs based off my wife's saying this is a good right thing. and Because I, I was more Amazing. of a... Yeah. And what if I say something heretical or, you know, I just lose my crap once yeah. or, you know. Um, Did you allow yourself to be human Matt Chandler, the person who just found out he had cancer and not try to be bigger, stronger because I'm a pastor? So, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, okay. Jason, if I'm honest. I, I, I wish I could say, well, yeah, this is exactly what was going on. But there was so much going on in my head and heart. I was learning so much about myself. I'm very much an older brother yeah. uh, and got that revealed quite a bit in that season. And then I'm thinking, me? Giving me cancer? I mean, for all the like guys I know who cheat on their wives and right. all the mess that we're dealing with all the time around here, you've got this 
pedophile. The, the, I mean, in me, you got me. And then I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how, what a wicked, horrific thought is that? I mean, I think yeah. I'm better than I, I mean, you know, right. so there was so much going on. It's hard to really kind of pinpoint, um, motivations there. And, but yet that, and, and this would be a great thing, I think, to end on the, it, as I dove into my own heart, here's what I learned. I love Jesus, man. I love him. I, there's just no question. I, I'm all in. He, he asked me to quit and move on. I'm doing it. I mean, I want him. He's my pursuit. But I also have learned that in that, when I make much of Jesus, a lot of people make much of me. And, and so that's a weird kind yes. of dynamic that, that I, I have to walk in. And I know some other guys who, who do what I do and, and at the level that God has called us into do. It's a weird thing that you have to kind of navigate where you know, like I know I get a lot of respect. I get a lot of opportunities. I get a lot of access because of making much of Jesus. So in this season where I'm thinking, okay, I'm about to stand right in front of him face to face. So in one sense, I, I had this, I can't wait for that. And in this other sense, I was thinking, okay, what are my real motivations? And then that's where, man, it had better be grace. <laughs> I mean, it just had better be grace and not any act of my own or any purity of my own or any righteousness of my own, or I'm anxious to stand in front of him. But if it's just his grace, then man, let's yeah. go. Yeah. And so that was, Powerful. I think that was the thing I most pulled out of that entire, that entire ordeal was, man, it, it's his grace alone or everyone's in trouble, me included, right? Wow, that's great. That's Matt Hasselbeck, so I want to ask you one last thing before we end. What is God teaching you right now? Uh, well, I think what's been completely evident to me this year, my first year out of the NFL and you know, starting at ESPN, is just how valuable that locker room community was to me. Sure. And whether it was teammates, you know, uh, you know, brothers as teammates, uh, some older, some younger. Usually, I'm the older though, late in my career. But uh, <laughs> coaches, uh, team chaplain, um, kind of some allies in the building. You know that, um, you know, just like you're a team. You know, you're a team of brothers together. We used to do this devotion all together in our locker room. It was sort of a fun game that we would do. It was almost like a competition, and you'd read this little. Uh, daily bread Bible story and you'd have to know like uh, it was a total game like you'd have to kind of know the you have to prove that you read it and it was sort of this fun game that we played awesome. but you <laughs> miss that you miss it wasn't the camaraderie of like hey man what's up it wasn't the camaraderie of like working on a team necessarily it was like that that um, that brotherhood that you have and you know now with my current job with ESPN I do I work Sunday mornings and I work Monday nights and other than that I'm um, basically a, a, a freelancer and it is a it is a it's so different and for 18 years in the NFL and however many years before that you know I was used to being surrounded by yeah. a bunch of guys and and having coaches that like tell you what to do I realized I realized that I'm very bad at coming up with an original thought sure like I am trained for like I, I, I'm good at like being a good loyal soldier I step into a room like all right what do you want me to do and I'll go do it. And I'll get other people to do it too. <laughs> but yeah. I don't have that, you know. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, you know, every Wednesday morning I'd get a game plan book. And then it was my ta task to memorize it and to make it happen and get everyone else on the same page. Now, you know, I come back from Monday Night Football after, uh, you know, traveling on the road and I start thinking about next Sunday. And then we have a, we have a big call and it's like... All right, what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> it's like, ah, uh, <laughs> tell me, you know. Yeah. So it's a, it's been an interesting year of transition, transition that way. So I think right now, actively, we just moved, and you know, just trying to find those people in my life and plugging in, where I kind of have that same kind of uh, network that pushes me to be better, and uh, you know, hopefully, I can be that to someone else also. So. Well, this has been awesome, Matt Chandler, pastor of the Village Church, Matt Hasselbeck. Longtime NFL quarterback, ESPN analyst. Thank you guys both. This has been great to, Thanks, to have this conversation. Thanks for putting it together. All right, so that was Pastor Matt Chandler from the Village Church and former NFL quarterback Matt Hasselbeck. And we are joined now by Raymond St. Martin, who is the Director of Digital and Media at Sports Spectrum and Pro Athletes Outreach. Raymond, your thoughts on what you heard from uh, Matt Chandler and, and Matt Hasselbeck? That was so many different angles there and so many powerful things that they touched on. And I feel like when people are honest and they, they tell the stories of their lives, there are pieces that relate, you know, to each individual that listens. And for me, you know, hearing Matt Chandler's story, 
of, you know, growing up in an abusive family, you know, where the mom was, was Christian and holding on to, you know, these very religious ideas. Um, and, you know, Matt being exposed to that and his interpretation of Christ being kind of, well, not kind of, but very skewed um, in his young age. But then in his heart, you know, Jesus knowing him and knowing that he had work for him to do, you know, was able to still reach him, you know, in that, in that circumstance. And then how he is and who he is as a person was able to gravitate toward, toward Jesus. I thought that that was, that was super powerful for me. And I really related to that. It's interesting when you have a pastor like Matt Chandler still not fully grasp the concept of whether Jesus loves him. And, you know, I mean, that's just, you know, it just shows that we're all human and that nobody who, whoever you are, whether you're a pastor or just a, you know, a dude working a nine to five every day, like we all have struggles and we all have the same sort of spiritual doubts and issues and things that we need to work through. Absolutely. I think, you know, the contrast between his story and Matt Hasselbeck's story of, you know, Matt basically growing up in the church, you know, growing up around chapel, growing up with parents that he only knew as these Christ loving people. Um, and then his story of how his faith really became his own mm. as others started to pour into his life. You know, it's that road that I think many different people are on. It's either they're living out the faith of their parents and their grandparents and they, they love Jesus, but do they really own their faith? Is it theirs? Like, is it their faith? You know, I think that was, that was really powerful too, Jason. I think that that's something that, that I, that I've learned here in this uh, even deeper is that we all have our own story and we all have our own faith story. We've all come to Jesus in different ways. And it's, it's amazing. And that's a really good point, Raymond, as, as we start to wrap and we think about, you know, we left last week's podcast last time, episode one, with a question. I think I'd like to do that again uh, and ponder the question of what is your story and what's the walk that you've taken in your faith? Because we all have our own stories and we all have to own our own faith, as you said. If we, if we try to just uh, believe what we've been told from other people, it's not real. We're just kind of trusting in man more than we're trusting in God. And I think it requires us to all explore and go a little deeper into the word and find out what our faith that we trust in and believe in truly is. That's amazing. I mean, I'd love to hear everybody's stories. I mean, yeah, that's maybe something to focus on this week is just being intentional with our time with others, you know, as we meet somebody and we, we speak to them and just sharing who we are with them and you know, what Jesus has done in our lives and what our faith looks like to them, that we might be a light. Raymond, I love what you just said there about hearing the listener's story. And so I'm going to open that up. And if anybody has a story, their faith story that they want to share and send to us, they can do that. You can tweet at us at sports underscore spectrum or at Jason Romano. You can email me directly, jasonromano22 at gmail.com. Of course, you can go to iTunes, subscribe on iTunes, and certainly leave a review. Uh, it helps get the word out. And in the review, you can tell your story right there, and we'll see it. And we can certainly grab it from there and, and read it on air. So I want to encourage you this week to share your story, to tell your story, not just to us, but to find someone that you can encourage, find someone that you can tell, find someone that you can share your life story with, because you never know who you might be able to impact. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Tune in next time as we talk to Derwin Gray, who is the pastor of Transformation Church outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. He's a former NFL player turned preacher, turned pastor. His story is awesome. I'm really excited for you guys to hear him. Uh, and he shares a story about how he came to know Jesus from a naked preacher. Yes, I just said naked preacher. So you have to tune in next time and hear Derwin Gray's testimony on how he came to be a Christian. It's a great story. Again, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time.